Shalom. This week begins the month of Elul, the last month of the year on the Hebrew calendar. A special time of self-searching, introspection, preparation for the immense process of repentance. And this week we are reading the Torah portion of Shoftim, Judges. And invariably, every single year, this week's Torah portion, Shoftim, falls out around the week of the beginning of the month of Elul, Rosh Chodesh Elul. Now, everybody knows that this month of Elul is this special time of spiritual preparation, stock-taking, repentance, preparation for the coming High Holy Days, the Days of Awe, the time of judgment, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Our parsha begins, Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your gates, which Hashem your God gives you, for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert judgment, you shall not respect someone's presence, and you shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make words crooked. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, so that you will live in the land and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. Now, on the metaphysical level, on the symbolic level, there is an, an idea, a concept, that this parsha, these words, about appointing, the need to appoint justices and officers, this alludes to spiritual preparation and teshuva, and that it's an exhortation that a person must safeguard against sin. A very fitting message, a very proper ethical warning for this month of Elul. Appoint judges and policemen in all your gates, bechol sha'arecha, meaning in your openings, at your entrances, your eyes, your mouth, your ears. You have to have watchmen there that will be vigilant, standing watch against incursions, etc. In other words, judge your actions, watch what you say, watch what you hear, and be on guard. But of course, as we know, any time we study the Torah, these verses don't lose their simple meaning, and they call to us, as we come into the land of Israel, build a society based on justice. Appoint justices and officers in all your cities for all your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Don't pervert justice. Don't show favoritism. Don't accept a bribe. Maybe the bribe, is, the bribe is military aid. Maybe the bribe is a diplomatic alliance. But the verse continues and tells us, using the word twice, righteousness, righteousness, shall you pursue, so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. In other words, the verse is perfectly clear. This pursuit of righteousness is the secret for possessing the land. He gives it to you, but in order for you to hold on to it, pursue righteousness. And the Holy Rashi comments on these words. Righteousness, righteousness, it means seek out a good court, proper judges, so that you will live and possess the land. And Rashi says, appointing proper judges is very important to keep Israel alive and settle her on her land. So there you have it from the lips of Rashi, his understanding of this verse. If you don't seek out a good system of justice, if you appoint over yourselves improper judges, they will kill Israel and they will unsettle her from her land. And where is this judgment coming from? Continuing here in the parasha, from the place of the Holy Temple, the verses tell us, if a matter of judgment is hidden from you between blood and blood, between verdict and verdict, matters of dispute, you have a question about an issue. The Torah tells us, you shall rise up and ascend to that place that Hashem your God shall choose. And you shall come to the Kohanim, the Levites, and to the judge who will be in those days, and you shall inquire, and they will tell you the word of judgment. So the Holy Temple is the seat of justice. And thus, as the month of Elul comes in, and in this month, all of these things are emphasized so much, the need for proper justice. 
the need for seeking righteousness. And we find ourselves in this month of Elul that we are still locked out of the Temple Mount. We have been locked out of the place of justice. So we are reminded that pursuing righteousness also conveys pursuing the place of righteousness. Now, early on in the Parsha, we were already told, actually, in verse 21 of chapter 16, you shall not plant for yourselves an idolatrous tree, any tree, near the altar of Hashem, your God, that you shall make for yourselves. And you shall not erect for yourselves a pillar, referring to an idolatrous platform, which Hashem, your God, hates. And so here, in this very Torah portion, we have an admonition against uh, anything idolatrous at all, anything that might smack of the remotest uh, form or uh, reminiscent of any other type of worship on the Temple Mount. So if that's the case, that the degree of reverence with which we are enjoined to be cautious about how the Temple Mount is kept is to such an extent that one is not allowed to plant any tree at all in the vicinity of the altar of Hashem because of an idolatrous, an idolatrous connection to trees. So do you think that we should allow the Temple Mount to be overrun by marauders, to be strewn with garbage, to be turned into a den of incitement and plots of murder against the Jewish people? There's so much in this Torah portion that seems to be a very divine confluence of this month, of this time, of our spiritual preparation, of everything that we are dealing with as a nation at this time. In this Torah portion, for example, we have the concept of a king, the commandments, or is it actually permission that's granted to us? And this is a question amongst the sages, is it a commandment or are we allowed to have a king? And this reflects the controversy amongst the scholars for Israel to have a, a king, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? When you come to the land that Hashem your God gives you and possess it and settle in it, and you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set yourself a king whom Hashem your God shall choose. From among your brethren shall you set a king over yourself. You cannot place over yourselves a foreign man who is not your brother. And he is warned in his behavior as well. Can't have too many horses. Shouldn't try to return the people to Egypt because going back to Egypt, you shall no longer return on this road again. And that's not just a reminder that we're not to return to Egypt. That's a reminder that there are certain roads that we've been down that we're done with. And we are specifically warned not to go back down those roads. And this king in Israel, he has one code that he goes by. He has one rule, and that is the Torah itself. And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself two copies of this Torah in a book from before the Kohanim, the Levites. It shall be with him, and he shall read from it all the days of his life, so they will learn to fear Hashem, his God, to observe all the words of this Torah and these decrees, to perform them, so that his heart does not become haughty over his brethren, not turn from the commandment right or left, so that he will prolong years over his kingdom, he and his sons amid Israel. Further on in this Torah portion, we have the very amazing idea of the cities of refuge. When Hashem your God will cut down the nations whose land Hashem your God gives you, you will possess them and you will settle in their cities and in their houses. You shall separate three cities for yourselves in the midst of your land. And what is the idea of these cities? This is a place for a, an unintentional killer to flee to. It's someone who did not hate him, his fellow from yesterday or before yesterday. He didn't strive to overcome him. He didn't stalk him or seek him out to kill him. He didn't plan against him. But for example, 
one who will come with his fellow into the forest to hew trees, and his hand swings the axe to cut the tree, and the iron slips from the wood and finds his fellow, and he dies. He shall flee to one of these cities and live, lest the Redeemer of the blood will chase after the killer, for his heart will be hot, and if he will overtake him, for the way was long, and he shall strike him mortally, there is no judgment of death upon him, for he did not hate him from yesterday and from before yesterday. So we have these cities wherein the unintentional killer should flee. And then, of course, if there would be a man who hates his fellow and ambushes him and rises up against him on purpose and strikes him mortally and he dies, and let's say that this fellow tries to take the opportunity and utilize one of the conveniently located cities of refuge, and he flees to one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there and place him in the hand of the Redeemer of the blood, and he shall die. Your eyes shall not pity him. You shall remove innocent blood from Israel, and it shall be good for you. So if right now we are reading about the cities of refuge for the unintentional murderer, the only place where the unintentional murderer could be protected, and the very specific commandment regarding the intentional murderer. How could we be considering at this time releasing more than intentional murderers, but demonic, bloodthirsty murderers back into the streets? At the same time, in this very Torah portion here, in the beginning of the month of Elul, when the resonance of the communications, the broadcasts that we are receiving from Hashem are so strong, we read in chapter 19 and verse 14, You shall not move a boundary of your fellow, which the early ones marked out, in your inheritance that you shall inherit, in the land that Hashem your God gives you to possess it. No one is to move any boundary. And then, of course, when Israel goes to war, we go out to battle against the enemy, and we see horse and chariot of people more numerous than you. You shall not fear them, for Hashem your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. It shall be that when you draw near to the war, the Kohen shall approach and speak to the people, and then the anointed Kohen, this is a process of illumination, where the Kohen speaks to the children of Israel, and then the officers speak to the people and they say, Who is the man who has built a new house and has not yet inaugurated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war and another man will inaugurate it. And then they say, Who is the man who has planted a vineyard and not yet redeemed it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war and another man will redeem it. And they say, And who is the man who has betrothed a woman and not yet married her? Let him go to and return to his house, lest he die in the war, and another man will marry her. And then, in the, in the uh, confusion, in the, in the uh, hullabaloo of all of these people who have a legitimate excuse, slipping out, then they say, the officers shall continue speaking to the people and say, and now, who is the man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, and let him not melt the hearts of his fellows like his heart, so he can slip away. Everyone will think he must be one of the vineyard or, or uh, house or marriage people. On a deeper level of meaning with these verses, we are taught that these men, it's not so much about a legitimate excuse that they have, that they have the right to return because they haven't yet turned the corner on this important life cycle event, but actually, the deeper reason why they should be exempted from battle is because they are going to be so concerned with what they haven't done yet. They're going to be so taken up with anxiety over the possibility that they won't get to redeem their vineyard or finish their house or marry their betrothed, that they're going to be engulfed personally in a certain negativity. And that negativity is going to have a very negative influence on their comrades. Because when Israel goes to war, it's also a war against negativity. And it's important 
for all of us to understand when we are facing the enemy that there's nothing to be negative about, that we must consider only the Kalal, only the nation, only the unit of Israel, and not draw down upon ourselves any negativity. But of course, this part continues and speaks about overtures for peace. When you draw near to a city to wage war against it, you shall call out to it for peace. So you see, there is a basis in the Torah for peace. But is it peace negotiations that are based on actually uh, self-destruction, on a, a total uh, implosion of all of our values and rights and sovereignty and promises and covenants? No. It shall be that if that city responds to you in peace and opens for you, then the entire people found within it shall be as tribute for you, and they shall serve you. And I won't continue reading here, lest I be accused of some sort of extremism, but you can read for yourself what Hashem's instructions are for the people of Israel and what the guidelines are for calling out peace and making overtures for peace. And of all of the timely ideas that find a confluence in this week's Torah portion at the very end of the parasha, in chapter 21 of Parashat Shoftim, we find the unsolved murder, the axed heifer. If a corpse will be found on the land that Hashem your God gives you to possess, fallen in the field, it was not known who smote him. So we have a, a death of undetermined origin, a murder, unsolved murder. Your elders and judges shall go out and measure towards the cities that are around the corpse. It shall be that the city nearest the corpse, the elders of that city shall take a heifer with which no work has been done, which is not yet pulled with a yoke, and the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a harsh valley, which cannot be worked and cannot be sown, and they shall ax the back of its neck in the valley. What a powerful ceremony. The Kohanim, the offspring of Levi, shall approach, for them has Hashem, your God, chosen to minister to him and to bless with the name of Hashem, and according to their word shall be every grievance and every plague. And all the elders of that city who are closest to the corpse shall wash their hands over the heifer that was axed in the valley. They shall speak up and say, Our hands have not spilled this blood, and our eyes did not see. Atone for your people Israel that you have redeemed. O Hashem, do not place innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel. Then the blood shall be atoned for them. But you shall remove the innocent blood from your midst when you do what is upright in the eyes of Hashem. What a powerful, moving ceremony. And how exactly does this relate to the unsolved murder? The city that is measured physically to be found closest to the corpse and the elders of the city who wash their hands over the axed heifer and they declare, our hands have not spilled this blood. Would anyone have thought in their wildest imagination, who would have the nerve to say, to imply that the elders of the city had any involvement with this murder? Of course not. But Rashi explains that perhaps they had seen this wayfarer and they had not accompanied him out of the city and given him provisions. This is very sensitive. This is tantamount to their having been responsible for his death. And so these elders wash their hands over the heifer and they say, our hands have not spilled this blood. The Torah enjoins Israel to such a high level of sensitivity and responsibility, communal responsibility. The nation, every individual within the nation is our responsibility. So what happens, God forbid, if by contrast the leaders of a community should actually 
have blood on their hands. Can those who free murderers wash their hands? Simply wash their hands over an axed heifer and say, our hands have not spilled this blood? This week, Parshat Shoftim, the beginning of the month of Elul, the time of repentance, the time of serious soul-searching and introspection. Indeed, the Torah gives us much to think about this week as we begin to prepare for our journey towards the days of awe and the realignment of our spiritual relationship with the Almighty.